mi casa no. so yeah this is a, a kind of prefacing for the introduction i mean i remember i sent you this um this quote because i'm always quite amazed when i'm reading up various things the way that alice keeps cropping up um, and even this weekend we had a a three-page spread in the Financial Times um, about the up-and-coming um, v &A exhibition. But uh, so on this, this is a quote, I mean, a, a quote from a technology um, guru-ish type person. Um, and a quote, yeah, the best book on programming for the layman is Alice in Wonderland because it's the best book on anything, you know, for the layman. And, uh, and it's quite true that a lot of the people who've used um, the Alice in Wonderland stories, you know, have varied actually. He got the ACM's Turing Award, but actually Alan Turing himself, I don't know whether you, you know this, um, he was also um, a fan of um, Alice. Um, and I went up to Bletchley Park a while ago, and, and during the Second World War, when they were doing the um, Breaking the Codes, um, they actually put on their own parody of Alice in Wonderland and created books as well because it was, mm. it was sort of a book that appealed to them and it does seem to appeal to across art, mathematics, technology, which is why things like games, you know, are so interesting to me. So this is from your, um, a little bit of a summary of yourself, but I'll give you a, some time to um describe the other things you're doing as well i you know i summarized it but i also put at the bottom some of the other things that you've done as well because you're not um you're not just a games designer although you're very well known before it for that i mean there there's an example of the um the plush toy the t-shirts and the mugs as well um they're all part of your kind of 3d experience rather than 2d do you want to you know talk a bit about you know how you got into it you know, and you know, and then also um, why Alice is such a muse for you. Sure, sure. Um, well, just on your point about Alan Turing and the attraction that Lewis Carroll's work um, has to people who might be in tech or in programming, um, I'm, I'm just now in the middle of a book called The Information by an author called James Gleek. And he actually goes into quite a bit of detail about the relationship between Charles Babbage and Lewis Carroll and a whole host of people who were very interested in cryptography and puzzles and logic and algorithms and sort of unraveling um, the nature of the relationship between language and mathematics, you know, sort of, and music, right? Sort of the Gödel Escher, Escher Bach um, trifecta. Um, so they, they actually go into quite a lot of detail about that. They mentioned the Alan Turing connection, um, but I think it's because Lewis Carroll himself was such a, a, a fan of puzzles, math, you know, riddles, um, the, the connection between all of these things, and he wove that into the books, of course. So it, it stands to reason that even as um, the books seem to have aged, things like logic are eternal, and puzzles that are based on those types of things are eternal, and so they will, they will um, always have an eternal attraction to people who understand or are driven or attracted to those types of things. Um, so it was, it was also one of the things that attracted me to it um, early on. As far as the, um, the biography goes, yeah, as, as you had on the slide there, I actually got my start back a very long time ago um, at a company called id Software, um, which they were sort of the, the vanguards in the space of turning um, games into 3D action games. And so um, I worked on things like Doom and Quake. Um, but one of the things that drew me to Alice after that experience was that those games are, if you've played them, they tend to be quite industrial. Um, there's no story to them. They're very fast paced. There's a lot of violence in them. Um, and working in that company, one of the things that I ran into very often was this sense that games and game engines didn't require story um, and that violence could be the end all be all of what was happening in them. Um, but I started to have a sense along with a lot of other people that things like puzzles and story mattered um, and, and would be important as an art form, but that you'd have to bring something by way of story and art to um, the medium. 
So um, that, was, that was partly where the idea for Alice came from, was just a desire to move um, as much as possible away from things like the shotgun, um, the, the Martian, you know, space base, the, um, the space marine of Doom and Quake, and into a more fantastical, magical, story-driven um, type of design. Um, so yeah, and then as you have it here, uh, the company that I run these days with my wife um, is called Mysterious. We're based here in Shanghai. And yeah, we do games, game design. Um, we do everything from like card and board games, um, and then also art and other kinds of collectibles like the plush toys and the clothing and the jewelry and all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, so I mean, I think the only thing that I saw you didn't do yet is perfume. So that'll be... <laughs> Well, my wife is currently working on a makeup set. And it's pretty <laughs> cool. So yeah, um, this is one of the the kind of interesting advantages to being in China. Of course, these days there's a bit of controversy around it, but um, there is the ability to basically make anything here. So if you have an idea, um, if you're a creative type and you want to you want to make stuff, um, this is obviously a really good place to do it. And so we've we've leveraged that with a lot of the stuff that you see here. Okay. Um... So going back to so with the the idea of Alice there, I mean, was it um, is, was it the link with the puzzles, the games that you know pulled you into using that as I mean, if I use the wrong words, I apologise. As almost like you know, as a vehicle or a framework for the for the three D games. Well, if, um, if if people have heard this story before, I apologise. I've told it a, a number of times about why did I choose Alice initially. Um, at the time, I was in California, and I was working at Electronic Arts, and I was given an offer that you don't often get in the games industry, and that was carte blanche to go and make a game, you know, come come up with an idea and, and make a game. Um, and it was as shocking to me then as it is, I think, rare um, in general, even to this day. But so I, I spent some time uh, trying to kind of reach around and think of, you know, ideas that would be... Um, ways to push the medium. I didn't want to just make another shooter because that's what at that time I was, I was known for, um, which, which by the way is a bit ironic because now I'm known for Alice and I'm sort of stuck there. Um, all, <laughs> all of my efforts to get away from Alice um, never seemed to get enough momentum to get me very far. Um, so I'm always coming back to her. But um, yeah, I, I thought a lot about public domain properties, and I thought about um, whether or not it made sense to try to invent something completely whole cloth and new. And, you know, part of the, the challenge there was to present something to the corporate um, masters that they would understand and that they would believe was marketable. And, um, you know, to them, marketability is, is much more important than probably any other aspect of why they would approve something. So, um, for, for Alice at the time, I was able to state, and I think it's still the case that it's probably one of the best known properties on the planet. Um, whether it's a public domain of property or it's just, um, you know, something owned by, uh, you know, sort of, sort of a big corporation. So that of course would be, um, attractive to a big corporation, like say Disney or electronic arts. The fact that so many people instantly recognize the character and the setup, um, goes a long ways towards, reducing their fear about people not knowing what it is that you're trying to sell. Um, so yeah, the, that kind of brought me towards her. And then as I began to explore it, um, what I discovered opened up very nicely was the fact that as a game character and as a game universe, there's so much possibility. Um, and it's not because there are no constraints. There, there are really good constraints, but they allow a lot of creative expression. And also that she, as a character, um, of course, we had to sort of veer her off the road a bit um, from the traditional story, but still the background of who she is as a, as a girl who leads into the character that we have in the games um, is a foundation that I think is enviable for any character that you might write, whether it be for literature or film or t television. Um, she's got a lot of great setup to her. So that was another sort of mark in her favor. Um, and, you know, at the time we, we, we got some artists involved in kind of sketching out early concepts on, around a couple of different stories. 
and it was just obvious that what was coming back for the exploration of the art for Alice, it just worked. We, we just knew it as we saw it and as we showed it to people, it just worked. Um, so I, I like to say that at that time, she really kind of came alive on her own. She took on a life of her own and she very much, um, a, a, almost immediately as we began working, I felt that she acquired a voice of her own. It was very clear. Um, it felt very natural to take her story in this direction. Um, and so that, that kind of cemented it all. Um, it all kind of came together in that fashion, um, story, art, character, um, and that opportunity. And um, yeah, here we are today. How many people work on the games with you when you're, you know, because it's, a, it's quite an undertaking, you know, with the, the amount of graphics, illustration, variation, storyline. Yeah, and over the over the years, it's grown. The size of the teams has grown. So back when I was working on on Doom and Quake, I was the eighth employee hired by id Software, um, and at that time, it, by the way, that included the receptionist at the time. So I was the seventh um, development person that was working inside of that company, and at that time in in game development history, a team that size could turn out a game in about a year or a year and a half that would be the level of quality and, and the breadth of content of something like a Doom or a Doom 2. And a game like that could then go on to make, um, you know, somewhere between five and $50 million or something like that. Um, by you fast forward to the most recent Alice game, Alice Madness Returns, we made that here in Shanghai and our core team inside the Shanghai office was 80 people. And then we employed another 300 artists to work on that project. So the, just the budget of that game eclipsed what the you know, games of the earlier era might have made in terms of total budget. I mean, in, to in terms of total um, revenue. Um, and so, of course, the, the budgets grew, the teams grew, and, and then the potential for success with them grew as well. But they, they become, um, and they have become, and they continue to grow um, in scale and scope and, and team sizes, it gets to be pretty crazy. Okay, um, I've, I'll move on to the next one because it's quite fu it's quite funny that even in the the Alice stories through the Looking Glass, um, Lewis Carroll himself has got the idea of if you like you know gamification, which I'm sure you you know as well. And he's captured, the, you know, he's captured the idea of um, life as a series of chess moves. Um, and, in the, and in the very first part of the, the book, he actually has the chess moves marked down so you could, you can move them on a chessboard, even though they wouldn't actually be very sensible. And they're the same moves that Alice makes during the book. So he, yeah, I think, no, go ahead. I was, if he was alive, I mean, so a little bit of me thinks that if he was alive today, that he would be interested in making Alice into a game rather than a book. Yeah, well, I think if he were alive today, um, his head might explode from all the things that we've accomplished uh, with game theory and mathematics and, and um, information theory in the time since. Um, again, this goes back to that close connection that he had with a whole group of people at that time who were trying to basically create a method for mapping out reality. That's, you know, back in the, the time where he was writing the books, our grasp of the understanding of the mathematics of, of even just everyday life was still um, pretty rudimentary. And things like information theory and the, the binary language that we used eventually to code computers and make games um, there was there was no sense of that yet, uh, and so they were all of them puzzling their way through it and coming up with um, philosophies for or algorithms for the dissection and recreation of of the things that we take for granted um, in the world these days. So I, I think um, that was a very um, kind of scientific impulse that he had, you know, sort of um, exploration of the unknown and the way that he went about it. Um, was very artistic, it was very playful, um, but in that time, that sort of playfulness, I think, was uh, a prerequisite because um, so much of what was being done kind of felt like nonsense. 
um, the you know the concept of of analog computers versus digital computers, where the output is not always the same. That it could vary depending on the temperature in the room, or if like literal bugs crawled into the you know the works, right? Yeah, and his background, I mean, and he was also um, an inventor. You know, he he made his flying mechanical bat, for example. Uh, mm. There's a story that he went round to Charles Babbage's house to buy um, a calculating machine. Yep. And, but um, I don't think it was for sale. They got a demo of it. And then I think I read somewhere else that when Edison was, and he must have been in the UK, demonstrating his recording device, you know, Carol was just interested in, you know, lots of technology stuff. And he was, you know, creating his own inventions as well. I mean, like the Alice books. Yeah, I can imagine um, given that uh, curiosity and his skill set, he probably would have been a fantastic video game designer. Yeah. So, so one of the other themes is, I mean, from both of the, the games, I've just put up this slide here, and it's two different um, plays, but it's quite, um, it's quite interesting that a number of people, including yourself, have sort of identified um, Alice and sort of, and I'll put it like mental distress as well, you know, and dealing with it. Um, I didn't actually see the one on the left, Alice in the Cuckoo's Nest. This was, you know, the, the wordplay is um, obviously one flew over the cuckoo's nest and it was done in a, a number of libraries around the UK. But I have seen the performance of Laura Wade's Alice, um, where the Alice in that case is dealing with the loss of her brother and kind of goes into a, you know, a strange world where, you know, because she doesn't want to deal with what's going on. And it's quite interesting in your, um, you know, in your games that you've picked up, you know, on the same theme, was there a, you know, I mean, have you seen any of these or is it? Uh... No, actually, as a rule, I try to avoid watching or hearing or, or viewing um, anything that is another interpretation of, of the Alice stories. Um, including the Disney films, and it's for a variety of reasons. I kind of want to keep my head clear of the potential influence, um, but also the fear of creating something that might step on the toes of something else that someone else has created, because that, that can be a real blocker, that you're sat there thinking, right, um, she's going to turn, she's going to go and do this next action or, or run into this sort of obstacle. But if you've gone through and consumed all of the content that's been created inside the Alice universe, and, and that's a lot, um, you will, at least for me as a writer, I would naturally then say to myself, ah, I can't do that, that's been done before. <laughs> and I don't want to have that problem. And so um, I, I make it a rule not to consume any other Alice content, just the books, um, yeah. and that's it. Gosh, it's quite the purest. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it's uh, my way of avoiding writer's block, so it's fairly important to me. Um, as far as the, the mental um, health angle on the story that I wrote, so um, I'm not sure who said it, but I, I've read it. I think a couple of different authors have said it, um, uh, something along the lines of the story that you you tend to tell when you write is is oftentimes your own story or in other words we we tend to tell our own story over and over again in a number of different ways um, so the the distress um, the dealing with distress through the mental landscape all of that um, derives from my own personal story my, my personal background as a child and um, I think you know un unfortunately my Wikipedia page has uh, it outlines some of that, even though I, I didn't give permission for it to be there, uh, but too late, it's there. So I, I drew on the experience of my childhood um, and the ways in which I tried to deal with that, um, either personally or through therapy, things like that. Um, and then I poured that into the story and her story. It was um, one of um, Lewis Carroll's uncle, I think, um, Luck, maybe it's Ludwig Dodgson. He was a commissioner of lunacy in, um, in London. So Carroll himself would have gone to the old style lunatic asylums and seen, you know, people there and the behaviours. And uh, there, was a, there was someone who did a, a presentation 
um, and he was explaining that the, like the Mad Hatter's Tea Party was actually a, a sort of thing they did to acclimatise you before you were, you know, before you were released back into the community. So we would have seen <laughs> some of those um, challenging behaviours. Yeah, I think that um, she, as a character, provides a really unique vehicle for that exploration of the of the interior landscape of our minds. And I think it's, again, it's one that people recognize you don't have to do much setup, um, again, because of the way that Alice and her story have become so uh, pervasive in the culture, and not just in Western culture, but around the world, the idea of going down the rabbit hole and this notion that where Alice goes is a sort of fictional place within her own mind and that these characters um, exist, you know, as a, as a function of her and her personality. Um, so it's, it's a natural vehicle for exploration of these types of themes. And I think that for me personally, the, the view was, you know, I think still is my view is that games also offer that sort of interactive exploration of difficult themes, but oftentimes game developers and game publishers tend to shy away from these themes because they, they are difficult to deal with. Um, you know, we, we don't want to watch, we don't necessarily want to watch depressing movies or depressing um, television shows. We don't want to play depressing video games. Um, so I think the challenge is to find a way to wrap the difficult topics and the exploration of them in compelling locations, compelling characters, um, and, and characters that you feel an affinity or an attachment or an association with, which again, you know, in the, in the way that the Alice character developed, uh, we, we've been able to deal with some very difficult subject matter, but do it in a way that um, if, you, if you base the reaction of the people who've played it, who themselves struggle, um, they seem to be quite, um, touched by or affected by um, the way that the story and those those elements have been presented. Uh, like another, as an aside, was um, there was a famous uh, actor-director. Have you heard of Pantone Nato? I'm, I'm not sure I heard that. Pantone? Yeah, he, uh, he was a, a founder of like uh, the theatre of cruelty, but it's one point he had a nervous breakdown and so his uh, his doctors in 1940 something decided it would be good for him to translate through the looking glass from English to French I think and um, mm -hmm. it didn't work out well because at the end of it he started to believe that he had written the book and that Lewis Carroll had plagiarized him. Wow. Yeah, well, that's um, a difficult thing to assign that sort of task to, to yeah. somebody who's in distress that way. Um, so I just... Oh, yeah, so I've got here a slide with actually one of your, um, your pieces of art, you know, which I'll be honest, I think is fantastic. And I bought a print as well. Um, mm. where obviously, we've got Alice as the main character and it's a, you know, obviously a tribute to Van Gogh as well. Yeah, well, to be clear, uh, this is not by my hand that no. these pieces are created. Uh, we do have a team of artists. Right now, the, the team consists of uh, eight people and um, they are all over the world. We have one in Australia, one in Israel, one here in China, there's one in Canada, there's one in uh, Italy. Um, and so this one in particular was done by one of our artists here in China. Her name's Joey. And she had actually worked on, she worked at my company, my studio here in, in Shanghai previously, Spicy Horse. And this, um, so she'd worked on Madness Returns. And then she also worked on this, which is a presentation we did for a concept called Alice Otherlands. And um, so the, the reason why I chose this was that the concept of Otherlands was that after Alice had completed the stories of the first and second game, the idea was that she had mastered the ability to travel into the other lands of other people, um, hence Otherlands. And um, I then went through the history of London at the time when Alice would have been, you know, in, in the region, we, we could have had a sort of um, an excuse for her to have bumped into people 
Um, and we found, I found that um, people like Thomas Edison had come to visit London at that time, or Van Gogh had been in London at that time. And um, with Alice and Van Gogh, the age um, crossovers, they were quite similar, the actual Alice and, and the actual Van Gogh. Um, and so we, we had um, a notion that Van Gogh may have even been in, in the same asylum as Alice, and uh, he would have been a little bit older, um, but that there could have been some sort of interaction and maybe, maybe even some sort of mentoring um, in the skill of surrealism of the mind. Um, so anyway, this, is, this was Alice venturing into his wonderland. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, um, it's also been Alice as a, a muse to other artists, I think, in a previous communication. You know, you've got people like um, Salvador Dali, for example, um, doing a whole bunch of work. And I think he even did some work that never got released by Disney for an Alice movie as well. Yep. Yeah, there's a bunch of that in a museum in Japan, um, in Hokkaido, I think. It's, uh, not Hokkaido, um, Hakone. There's a big uh, museum there that's got some of that, those pieces in it as well. Yeah, and it's funny that you, you mentioned the Surrealists as well, because um, one, of, uh, one of the members who's probably on the call is, um, is an expert on Alice and the Surrealists. And she was also amused to um, the Surrealists as well, as was Lewis Carroll. Hmm. Well, it's, it stands to reason. There's a lot to explore there. And I think that um, if, you're, if you're into, you know, sort of the nonsense of the mind and creativity, then there's going to always be an attraction. So another question then, obviously you're in Shanghai, which isn't Japan, but um, the other art forms, how do you, I mean, how do you regard things like anime? And this is from... Um, the Japanese um, Alice in the Land of Hearts. Have you, have you seen that? Or well, like I said, I avoid. yeah, I go out of my way to um, <laughs> to avoid it. I what I can say about Alice and Japan, the the Alice um, of the games I created, uh, is that she's hugely popular there. Um, when we went to release the second Alice, and we did a press tour in Japan. Um, the head of marketing there told me that that the Alice game was selling like crazy and I said I didn't know that it had been released yet and she said no no the first Alice game which at that point you know was sort of 10 years old um, and then we did an art book of Alice Madness Returns which initially was released in English and uh, after uh, a week or so after the release it was the number one best-selling um, it was the number one best-selling foreign book on Amazon.jp, and it stayed like that for apparently for a, a month or two months until the publisher relented and decided to produce a Japanese language version of that art book, and um, that thing apparently sold like crazy as well. So she's got um, huge, huge fans in Japan. Yeah, we had um, again. Um, we and the late Amanda Canell, who spoke about. Um, Alice and uh, Yayoi Kusama, mm -hmm. and yeah, it is fascinating. And so, so the, these were two others as well. Obviously, if you avoid, um, if you're avoiding all the influences, these are uh, other ways, if you like, that um, Alice has been reinterpreted, you know, in different media. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm aware of it, and it's funny how, how often people send me messages or emails and say, hey, have you seen this new um, interpretation? So I will admit that when the most recent Disney movies came out, uh, the ones that, that had Johnny Depp in them, um, I did go to see the first, uh, that first one, and I went with my writing partner, R.J. Berg, um, and we went to a theater in San Francisco and saw that first one, and both of us had to hold the other one down by the arm to not let us stand up and walk out <laughs> we 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 were not um we were not fans um of that at all and um so yeah i think oftentimes when i when i have broken the rule and looked at other interpretations um i'm usually i'm just not that interested i'm and that's not to say that i think we have the best or not, nothing like that um but in my mind i've been working on this alice that we've created for the games for so long and, and that I, I have a hard time 
viewing or understanding or, or getting attached to the the other interpretations by the way i like that tom petty song a lot i was actually listening it, to that in the car today <laughs> it, is, it is fantastic yeah i don't know if you've seen all the cosplay that gets done for um, our alice video game but if you go and you look on facebook or instagram um, there are cosplayers around the world uh, that are just phenomenal. They they take the the costume designs that we do, the dresses for Alice, and they they recreate them. And the detail that they put into them is is just fantastic. I mean, there's proper artistry going on there. Is that just for sort of um, what we would call it conferences and exhibitions, or is there a? I know there's a cosplay genre, if you like, but. Um... Well, they certainly go to the cosplay conventions um, and they like to wear these, um, you know, the, these costumes um, in, in those types of settings. But you also find that a lot of the people that do this, they, they do it sort of professionally. And um, that means that they, you know, they go out and they do their own private photo shoots and they, they use professional photographers and pho photo editors, um, you know, some of them have brands of their own as cosplayers and they they make a living being cosplayers. So they're not just playing Alice, they actually play a whole range of characters. And so that's, it's an art form in and of itself. Um, and it's, it's a proper skill. I mean, when you see the, the dedication that some of these artists have, you, you start to understand it. So I guess one of the, the other pieces, because that was one of my interests in, is in um, what the academics call remediation. You know the way that the the Alice story has been taken, and like you've done, and been taken in a, into a different media, altered. And so this last quote um, I've used before, um, and just wondering how do you think that? I mean, in your case as well, how the Alice story and the visual storytelling method, you know, will develop. Well, you know, I, I read this quote before we started and um, I take a bit of exception with it especially when you try to apply it to games or interactive medium um, without uh, agency in the characters or, or having a reason for them to be and a goal for them right so yes you can be the Mad Hatter or you can be the teapot um, the problem is what does the teapot want right and so when you try to go back and forth between characters in interactive medium, it's really important you set them all up. So it's like, you know, it's a good question to kind of think how many games have ever, ever been developed with a shifting perspective of the characters. There are a few, by the way, um, but that's uh, a lot more work and um, you do have to put a lot of thought into multi-perspective storytelling because I think what you'll see, like there's a lot of AR, VR demos out there, like virtual reality demos where you put the goggles on, um, where they don't put a lot of storytelling into them because they feel that, hey, this ought to stand on its own just because it's so cool. Look what you, you know, you're in a virtual world. Um, but the experiences aren't very sticky and you don't stay in there for long because once you've overcome the novelty of it, which I think at the time when this was, you know, this quote was written in 1991, the idea of interactive medium was still very novel in the sense that you didn't need story in order for it to, to capture people's attention was still very much a thing. I, I remember a direct quote from our lead technologist at the time on Doom and Quake, um, John Carmack said to us directly, um, we need story in our games as much as you might need story in a pornography, uh, in a porn film, right? So, you know, back then, um, I think that there, there wasn't the sense that, that you needed it and you could be anything. But in the time since, I think we've discovered that it's kind of boring to be the teapot um, and that you need to pick a central character. And um, as far as the evolution of this goes, I, you know, I don't know that storytelling in itself has evolved very much since the beginning of storytelling because you still have to have those basic motivations and drives. Um, the story you know, sort of plot structures and, and um, twists and turns of Shakespeare still function today. And um, those things will still function, you know, hundreds of years from now. I don't know that we've invented new narrative structures to pivot on and new ways to, you know what, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, don't, I don't think games are going to be the thing that um, creates that. Yeah, there needs, I mean, in this you're right in that 
whatever you are, there needs to be some context or motivation to it. It's not in, I mean, and I think that going back to the time, maybe this was written, was it the second life, the virtual world? Yep. Yeah, and that, that would have been in that. I, I don't know if second life existed in 91, but um, there were virtual worlds that were, were coming online. Um, I think, you know, the Ultima, the Ultima games, Ultima Online, things like that were, were springing up. Second Life may, maybe was starting to come into fruition at that time. Now I can remember, I mean, the problem would be that you get into it and then it's, what do you do? You know, you're right. You know, what do you do then when you're in this virtual world? It's more interesting right. than you do in the real one. Well, I think over time what we've seen is um, this sense that, you know, somehow the technology will present a new form of storytelling, but it, I don't really know that it has. And um, the same thing goes with the concept of gamification, that somehow gamifying a particular process will, um, you know, revolutionize the way that people learn languages. Well, no, it's still just a lot of work and practice mm -hmm. to learn languages. It doesn't matter how much uh, gamification you stick on top of language learning. How it's still done. Yeah, it's still hard. It's still done by yeah, rote. Yeah, it's very hard to get into that top 10 on the leaderboard on Duolingo if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. On Sunday nights, you just want to get top ten. Um, yeah. So, so what? What currently are there? Are there Alice projects? I mean, um, that you're currently working on? Yeah, well, we're working on the design and pre-production phase of a third Alice game, which would actually be a prequel, and that's called Alice Asylum. And that will actually go back to the period where um, in our game space, Alice is 13 years old and it's just after the event, the, the fire which, um, in which her family died. And in this story, uh, we're doing a lot of setting a foundation for what comes in the second two games, but we're also resolving the overall story. Um, we, so we wrap it all up. We, we go back to go forward. I don't want to say anything more than that because there may be people who um, don't want the spoilers, but if you're interested, um, we do share tons of this on um, various social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and then we have uh, a platform, platform called Patreon. And that's what powers um, the team of artists that we have. And so we're producing um, illustrations and game design and, and writing. And of course, um, props and things like the Cheshire Kitten uh, plush that you showed earlier. So that work is being done and we update um, once or twice a week with, with new uh, content. And um, so people can be directly involved and we're, we're trying to engage something called crowd design. So it's not just me by myself sat there writing, but we're actually writing stuff and then we're gathering feedback from the audience and then we're writing stuff and we're gathering feedback. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. Okay. So I think that I've, um, let me check and see if I, I'll stop the share. So I'll do that. Let's see what, uh, if I can scroll back. Um, ah, so I'll, I'll go through. So first one is from Brian Sibley. So the, if I'll read it out, the universe universality of the Alice books is indisputable. But how do you view the character of Alice herself? in the context of Dodgson's original writing and what features of that original characterization have you kept as part of your portrayal? So our Alice, um, to be clear, is the Alice in the books, in Carol's books. She's not the Alice of the real world. Um, and by the way, if anybody ever asks, that's why there's no crossover between her and Carol, because Carol wasn't in the Alice books either. Um, and the things that I think we appreciate about her in the game um, in the game space are many of the same things that people love about her in the books that she's precocious um, she's curious uh, you know she's an explorer and a, an experimenter um, you know she's she's willing to challenge um, whatever whatever she finds sort of the status quo um, in Wonderland um, she's a bit brash you know and um, so all those things uh, make for a good main character in the games, um, the same that they make for a good main character in the books. She's, um, she's likable, you know, she's, she's fun. And um, she is, I think ultimately one of the things I like about her is she, she does tend to stand very well on her own. She doesn't need 
supporting characters around her. She is an individual explorer in her own space, um, and that, that works really well for our format. Okay, the, again, Brian um, has got a second. Do you think that the Burton films, you saw the Burton film, so do you think that the Burton films were influenced by your Alice? Um, I hope not, <laughs> because what I just said about what I like about Alice as a character um, was one of the biggest violations that I felt that took place in the films. And, and I, I shouldn't say films because I've never seen the second film. Um, one of my biggest issues with the film, the first film, was the fact that the Alice in that film had no agency. So in other words, um, you watch this entire adventure and her trying to come to terms with a, a number of of interesting challenges, um, whether it was her coming of age um, or uh, of her in a relationship with her family. But in the end, when the manifestation of all of this was presented as the Jabberwock, someone says to her, take the blade, you don't have to do anything, it'll do all the work for you. Well, <laughs> that's lame, you know, like, that's like giving Luke Skywalker a, the, the magic lightsaber and saying, don't worry if you haven't figured it all out, it'll just work you know um so I, you know i don't know I, I i wasn't a big fan and um, there are a lot of other things i i found unlikable but i, I we won't go too far into that i don't think you're the only person who uh, had that view as well you might be and be pushing an open door with that one yeah well it's and it's a shame too because visually it was obviously be visually beautiful um the score the sound the costumes i mean so much about it the acting there was so much potential there but i feel it was it was ruined by uh, a soft approach to what could have been a really good you know hard story for her okay um francesca colx has got a question about um you're saying that one of the stories that shaped your own life was the dark crystal and so there's uh, been a remake about the and it's all about the interconnections of the mind and nature so how about have uh, our lessons the dark crystal crossed over and over again in the 21st century mm. we try well first of our own world and ourselves yeah so first off uh, a warm hello to francesca because she and i um, have chatted in the past, so I, I know her quite well. Um, so I'm glad she's here. Um, yeah, she's probably aware of the fact that the there was an inspiration, a moment of inspiration when I was searching for what the um, this game would be, the, the concept that I would deliver to EA when they asked me to come up with something. And it was, um, I didn't know at the moment, but it was a song. And in the song at the beginning, there was a sampling from a movie and there's the mention of a time of wonder and the crystal cracked. And um, so I heard this and I heard the word wonder and that was what triggered me to, oh, wonder, wonderland. Right, what about an Alice in Wonderland game? Oh my God, you know, and of course the song I was listening to also had a bit of a dark um, tone to it. So immediately I was, my mind was flooded with um, a sort of darker twist on this. And then later on I learned that that sample came from uh, lines in the Dark Crystal. I think it's the opening sequence of the Dark Crystal, actually, where they they kind of do the exposition to set up the the background of the narrative. Um, so that was uh, the the thing that triggered it in my mind. And um, as far as the new series go, I haven't had a chance to watch it because we just had a baby boy, and <laughs> that takes a lot of time. <laughs> and so people don't know. I mean, and so by Dark Crystal, just in case people don't know, that's the the Jim Henson, David Bowie film. Mm. That's how I always... <laughs> um, so there's a question from Lindsay about, uh, has there been much criticism about the amount of violence in the, um, in the Alice stories? It's a good question and it's, it's interesting because our sense of what is violent has shifted so much over time, right? So if we all went back and looked at Doom right now, um, we would view it as a as a pixely blobby mess on the screen, and you'd have a very difficult time discerning the blood from the bricks on the wall. Right? It's it's very 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 low resolution. It's incredible how low resolution it is, and yet for some reason in in the era of Doom, the way, when we viewed it, um, we viewed it as being incredibly high fidelity. Right? This was our mind filling in the blanks because we'd never seen high fidelity before it's a there's that's a whole another topic of its own by the way look there's a there's an article in wired you should look up about a guy a lumberjack in canada who lost his sight and then they put electrodes in 
and he was able to see through a camera, but the, the density was only like eight by eight, or so 64 pixels, but he was able to perceive the whole world around him through 64 pixels of, the, of these sensors. Anyway, um, back in the day, we thought Doom was hyper-violent and it was rated M, but if you were to try to go and get that rated as a game now, it would probably be E for everyone. Um, so not only has the technology moved away in such a, in such a fashion that like, we don't even perceive Doom to be bloody anymore, um, but also our, our sense of what is violence in a game has shifted. So the first Alice was rated M, and I think it was the first game that EA ever published that was M. Um, and at one point we had to change the box art because the retailers were complaining that she was stood on the cover of the box holding a bloody knife. And that was like, no, no, you can't have a knife on the cover. Now look at games, you know, GTA is the favorite sort of horse to beat on this topic where you've got, you know, the characters on the, on the cover of the box with guns and, you know, um, it, it, it screams violence. And the, the games that we produce these days are incredibly violent. So like when we produced Madness Returns, there was nothing in the game that at that point really warranted it being an M-rated game. EA was pushing us to make it more M-rated, <laughs> in yeah. fact. Um, so the, the bar is constantly moving. Um, and, and we're getting to a point now, though, where the technology can just, you know, you could render anything and it's be horribly graphic and violent. Um, it's not of a particular interest to me. And for the Alice story that we tell, I've never tried to push the violence angle. In fact, when EA came and said, make the game more M, um, don't look this up if you're <laughs> easily offended, but I sent them a bit of art that was um, X-rated. <laughs> and I said, you mean like this? And then they didn't ask me to put more, more of that type of content <laughs> in the game. Um, so uh, I, I don't see, you know, um, that these, the games I make, there, there's enough violence, enough violent games being made. And I don't, I don't feel that um, the games that I make and that Alice's story are necessarily the place where more violence is needed. Okay. Uh, Katie Hume, who's one of your um, Patreon patrons, um, has got a question about the, the poetry <laughs> in the Alice books, like The Hunting of the Snark. So have you mm. considered incorporating this into the riddles and puzzles of asylum, particularly regarding the stages of grief? Hey, Katie, very nice to see you. I see you've got your Cheshire kitten there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a good question. I think that um, one of the things that I've been toying with in the writing for the new game is the idea of it overall being much more of a puzzle narrative. Now, the, the problem is, again, I don't want to kind of I don't want there to be spoilers in this because I don't know how many people here would be bothered by that. But um, we have talked about it quite a bit. Um, and, and actually that book that I'm, I'm listening to right now called The Information, because it's talking about signals and signal interpretation and compression and codes and cryptography um, and, and how Lewis Carroll had an association with all of this in very early days. It got me thinking that in our narrative, uh, I really want it to be that Alice is following this series of of clues that almost come across as a sort of cryptographic adventure, you know? So um, to Katie's point, that could be in things like poems and in things like um, songs in the game. And then we also tend to put a lot of um, iconography. So we, we use um, the, the, the symbols of alchemy quite a lot because there's alchemy symbols themselves have tons of meaning loaded into them. Um, so we're going to use symbology like that as well. And through all of that, I'm hoping that the players will, yeah, they'll piece together the riddle of, you know, that, that's what the character of Alice is following. That's what piques her interest. That's why she's on this particular adventure, because these, these riddles start kind of showering down on her and she's, she's got to work her way through them. Okay. Um, I heard someone's corrected me that David that was Labyrinth. I was thinking of rather than the Dark Crystal. Yeah, I think Dark Crystal is the one with the puppets. <laughs> I, Lambert had puppets too, but it did not have David Bowie. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I haven't got, there are no other questions in the chat box. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll open it up so that um, if people have got questions, um, I'll trust them all not to shout over each other. 
That's a lot of trust. (laughs) Yeah, she knew them. Can I I just come back to you on the violence? Uh, Can you you hear me? Yeah, Yeah, I can hear you. No, 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 uh, there was a second part to to that question, but it wasn't really a question. It was simply saying um, there is criticism about violence in treatments of Alice, but there's so much subliminal and not so subliminal violence in the originals um we had a talk once on the um on uh alice and violence and um it, ju- it just sort of poured out so i'm just saying um in supporting you in a way or supporting anyone uh that it is there and it's simply um re-channeled for today and that that's all i it's not really a question, but it's just a point that that um, it, it happens to be true. One point. of the one of the points that um, I often make when when people want to criticize uh, the violence, which is fair, it's fair to criticize, you know, to be a critic yeah. of, of media, um, but is yeah. that everything that's happening in, in the games is happening inside of her mind. And so the idea is that if there is violence, it's her mind enacting violence on itself. Um, she's, she's struggling with issues and problems. And in the struggle, we see that manifested in the visuals, in the, in the visuals as violence you know, between two characters. But you know, one of the things that I like about the kind of violence we have in Wonderland is it's never violence against innocent humans you know, by running them over randomly on the street. It's, it's never... Um, the portrayal of of meaningless violence, because every action that Alice takes within the the realm of Wonderland is an action that is is furthering her um, her, her movement towards her goals, and and her goal is to be healthy and to get better, right? It's not she's not in it for treasure, she's not in it for glory, and you know she's in it to to heal herself. Yeah, thank you. Just come to you. Uh... I mean, Brian had a couple of questions. I wonder if he's got any more. I was going to speak to uh, Lindsay's point on um, the violence in the Alice games. If you even look at, you know, uh, the whole scene with the Duchess and then the whole bit, um, and then even the walrus and the carpenter, which I believe uh, references to that make an appearance in the second level of Madness Returns. Um, you know, it's just, just, it, it's subtle, like things that you pick up reading it a second time around when you're a little older. But it's 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 not. There's there's been arguments made that initially it's not technically a, a children's book, as it were. But that's a whole other debate. Yeah, well, the whole debate about violence in media is one that I I always find quite interesting. I mean, coming from the Doom era, um, we were sued by Jack Thompson. We were sued during the time of the Columbine. Uh, massacre uh, because there was this sense that doom somehow played a role in the violence that that was enacted um, in that incident. Um, But, you know, every time that people talk about violence in games, I'm quick to point them back to, like, say, for instance, um, Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare, because, I mean, that's probably one of the more violent um, you know, literary creations that that there ever is. And and if if you've never seen the Julie Taymor um, version of that, uh, on on film, I mean, it's that's, <laughs> and so, you know, it's not like violence in media is something new. Um, and I, I was I was raised um, in a Christian household, being read the Bible as a child, and I'm pretty sure I remember there was a lot of smiting going on in there. Uh, and so, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't I don't know. I think that the idea that we shy away from it, um, but when it's nonsensical. Um, and it doesn't fit the purpose of the story, then sure, you know. It's and even something. when you look at things like uh, Laurel and Hardy and the Three Stooges, they weren't exactly hands off with each other. Yeah, exactly. I think one of the things that I found so interesting about Americans games, and um, hello Americans, nice to see you again. Um, we, when we did this interview um, ages ago, I'm just holding up the Lewis Carroll review, you can find the interview online. I, I think I said to you how I, how I thought you really hit the nail on the head, head in your interpretation of Alice, and you said, you know, all of the violence is occurring in it, it's happening in the mind. And so it does in the own book and the whole 
book's purpose is meant to be cathartic. It is a cathartic journey. Everything that's confronted within it is meant to be overcome. So the whole underground journey, borrowed from Greek mythology, of course, um, is meant to be cathartic. And Lewis Carroll himself writes in the appendix to the book, which is called an Easter greeting, that this is meant to be healthy amusement. It's meant to be overcoming all of the things that are dark and difficult. And it's meant to help you to be a guide on this journey. So I think you really absolutely hit the nail on the head when you did the whole thing. And you said, you know, the point about mediation was really interesting because you found slightly different means for it. And I think Lewis Carroll gives a great, great approach for that because what you've done is basically the same thing Lewis Carroll did just by another medium. Hmm. Uh, there's an important concept that we're wrapping into the the new story, and that is that without the confrontation, um, w without a confrontation with ca chaos, there is no transformation. So, yeah. in terms of um, it being our physical health, um, you know, as an example, exercise is a kind of chaos to our bodies, but without it, we are not healthy. And the same thing is true of us as individuals psychologically, that if we don't have challenging experiences, we don't grow. And in fact, we, we tend to become static and, you know, being static is being dead, being in stasis, not, not moving, you know. So a healthy amount of chaos and a healthy amount of, if you want to call it violence, but, you know, challenge or obstacles um, is necessary for a healthy being. And that is a very big theme that's in the, the game that, or the story that we're working on now. When I'm Katie, really looking forward to that. When Katie mentioned uh, the walrus and the carpenter a few moments ago, and in, in the light of what you've just said, it seems to me that's a, a very, very good example of Alice having to face conflict of, of, and a matter of choice and challenge of what is good and what is not good in, in her debate about which is the preferable character is the walrus better than the carpenter <laughs> or the carpenter better than the walrus and you know that whole setup of, of the fairly violent behavior of the walrus and the carpenter towards the oysters becomes for alice uh, a complex a complex idea about which which kind of violence is preferable or better or more excusable than the other so i think you're right those challenges are, are confronted by alice again and again as they are in the in the courtroom scene with the duchess and so on so you're you're i think you're absolutely correct in saying that that challenge is part of what lewis carroll was setting up in the character hmm. This is, it's a topic that's touched on in that book, um, again, that I'm reading now, the information, because in the, in the exploration of logic, um, it, it tips over into philosophy and in the philosophy of, it's sort of the, you know, the, the train track dilemma, right? You know, do you pull the lever um, to run over the one guy in order to save five guys or do you, right? Well, this is logic and it's the kind of things that were being explored at that time by Carol and by Babbage. And it made a lot of people very uncomfortable. They didn't want the universe broken down into logical elements that could result in the, the analysis of and decision to pull the lever. It seemed immoral. It seemed in that, you know, it wasn't natural, right? Um, but it is the kind of thing that I think we're seeing more and more, and I don't want to go into politics, but we are seeing more and more these days that um, people are being taught that the idea of a binary outcome of A is better than B um, can't be talked about, you know, that everybody has to be given a prize or that every answer is correct or that every solution should be explored. Uh, you know, not, not, it, that's not really the way the world works. Um, so I think, again, that's one of the reasons why that topic is being explored in the story that we're, we're writing now. Is the book you're talking about um, American, is it James Dlyke, G-L-E-I-C-K? Correct. Okay, I would have, yeah. I mean, I think he also wrote earlier books as well, I, know, I think on chaos. That's yeah. correct, yeah. The book before that was called Chaos, and he has a few others as well. He's a phenomenal author. Yeah, and I mean, and going back to the um, the cryptography, you know, and the puzzles as well, I mean, going at the time that Carol was writing all of that, I mean, he had a background in, you know, in just coming up with puzzles all the time. And now, um, I think one of my ideas was if he was working today with all the cryptography that's required in communication, but, you know, that's another area of you know, I mean, he would have been so happy with all the, the new tools that he would have been given. Mm, absolutely.
Are there any questions from anybody else on the call? Is I know. None that I can ask without uh, spoilers. <laughs> no. Um, well, if there isn't, I mean, I'll, um, if it's okay with everyone, um, I mean, I've recorded it and I'll see if I can put it up on YouTube because I've certainly, I mean, hopefully, I mean, um, everyone has learned a little bit more today, you know, about the work that American McGee has been doing. The Lewis Carroll Society is an unusual group um, as a well. <laughs> And, um, but I do appreciate the time that you've, uh, that you've given us today, particularly as it's the end of your working day as well. Um, Thank, you. Yeah, so, Thank you very much. And also, if you, um, if you think that you need any information, feel free to use us as a resource as well. Uh, sure. I really appreciate the invite. Um, it's uh, very nice to speak with everybody and, and to have, I guess, the implicit blessing um, on the games, <laughs> finally. So <laughs> if, if Lindsay wants to write a, a retraction letter to the, <laughs> to the the earlier admonishment, that would be great. No, um, no, I really appreciate the invite and I'm happy to talk to everybody. And, um, you know, you, you're all of you welcome um, to check out what we're working on. And uh, I'm always happy to hear feedback um, from everybody.